June Wayne, you are probably the only artist I've ever known that is so multi-talented. You've done, my gosh, everything from jewelry design to tapestries to um, you're an entrepreneur, you've been a feminist, and all of those plus you're, you're first of all and foremost an artist. How, how did they all work together? Start with the jewelry design, that's pretty interesting. Well, the jewelry, I, I think everything yeah. in my life is the result of realistic accident. What the society does mm -hmm. to me, where I'd find myself at a given moment. Uh, when I was in my teens, I needed to work, so I worked I worked in an automobile parts factory. This was in Chicago? In Chicago, yeah. You got what jobs you could, and and I'm um, uh, would like to be able to say that I shaped my life. But reality very often shaped me, or shoved me into this corner or that. Because <clears throat> if you look at artists, <clears throat> we all have a very spotty yeah. history. We know how to do all kinds of crazy things, and they're all very practical things. Uh, I have a reputation as an entrepreneur. I'm anything but. It's true that I made a lot of money for other people, but not for myself, which is the soul, after all, of entrepreneurship. Yeah. I had lots of jobs, and I had my first show in Chicago when I was 17. That show was seen by a, an official of the Department of Public Education of Mexico. And I received an invitation to come to Mexico and have a show, which I did. And my mother, foolishly, did not think there was anything odd about that, although it was thrusting me into a country where to be a woman, young and without a duena, was really a dangerous circumstance. But I didn't know all that. Off I went. And I spent the better, a good part of the year of 1936 painting in Mexico. And then I had a big show at the big, I don't know how big it was, mm -hmm. maybe 30 pieces prepared there, um, at the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico oh. City. What I also got was a very good taste of what it's like to be a woman in a third world country, which it was at the time. And although Mexico has quite a history of women heroines who, as you know, went with the armies of Pancho Villa and others, still to be a gringa, 18 years old, without a protectors and, uh, and money, which might have made it even worse. It was quite an education, and I grew up very fast. I was born just before the First World War ended. I lived through the Depression. My mother was a single, a divorcee. She was divorced from my father uh, at a time when to be a divorcee meant you were sexually untidy. <laughs> It also meant that, that it was very hard to get a job. So, and my grandmother was a very early widow. So the three of us, we were a female household and in a world of nuclear families. And from that I got the idea that there is more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> you know? I was very aware of the hazards of being an unprotected woman and also how hard it was to make your way. My mother was the father, in effect, in our household. She earned the living. My grandmother raised me. And as you know, I did a suite called the Dorothy series, which is sort of a feminist, semi-feminist biography of my mother. But when I look at life Practically, it's my grandmother who's sitting here because it's from her that I got all the warnings on how to 
make my way. And she's also saying to me, well, you did a nice thing for Dorothy. Where do I fit? <laughs> so she's still waiting for me to recognize her. You are known as a very strong and leading feminist. Mm -hmm. And you've done a lot to change, change life for women. I've done what I can, you know, well, like, you, a, like all of us. Well. Yeah. My question is, how did you find that gorgeous husband, Hank, who went along with these? Because most husbands don't do that. Well, first of all, he wasn't going to be a husband. He was going to be a lover. And um, we got married, actually, for tax reasons. We were, we were already shacked up and we were about to pay our taxes when we realized that if we were married, we would save about 10 grand. So we got married and took the money and I had to go to Europe anyway for Tamarind and we, off we went and had a great time with this extra money. And the minute we got married, they changed the law. So the very next year, instead of paying less, we had to pay more. And I figured over the 40 years that we were together, we probably paid an extra 10000 a year every year. That's a lot of money just because we were married. You should have gotten divorced. We talked about it. But there were, you know, it meant dealing with lawyers and, and there were better things to do. And so we didn't. But I would certainly enjoy having that money in my pocket right now. <laughs> Uh, however, I have to say that Hank was infinitely keener on the problems of women than I was. I was living it, but he saw it. He was a very shrewd observer, and he would often say to me, now you're trying to make this such and such point for Tamarind. You don't understand. They're not listening to what you say because you are a woman. If you send somebody in who is male, you will get what you want with the identical argument, but they won't listen to you. And so it wasn't until there was enough rhetoric around in the early 70s that I could begin to uh, and it was hard, but that I could begin to say openly or to criticize openly. For example, I used to have a lot of fun on panels. I would usually be the only woman. And everybody was speaking manlish, the guys, you know. So, and so you know how you have your own little microphone and this is, somebody get up and make some statement and the artist he or the, you know, the artist he, he, he. And I would just pull this over and say, or she, or she. And it would start rattling the guys, and the audience would get it, and the women would start. Even the non-feminists would start clapping. And it would disrupt the situation by dramatizing the language. Apropos right now, I'd like to comment that in my opinion, women's issues have been swallowed up, subsumed by all the other issues. And that at this time, we seem to have a real lack of talent among women who know how to enunciate women's issues, just as we have a lack of talent among politicians at the moment. Uh, it, it's very important for opportunities also to come along when talent is there, leadership talent is there. And I think I was appalled by the length of time it took the women leaders to come out and sort out the Clinton thing and finally make a statement. I was just shocked by that. And right now it's very hard to hear women's issues stated in any way that you could identify as feminism, if we have to depend on Bush talking about liberating Iraqi women, you know, we're really in trouble. And while Carrie's wife is a good um, person, 
uh, and I would rather vote for her than for him. Um, we have a lot of uh, problem with talent, and I don't think that the Democratic team is talented. It isn't stating, it isn't framing our issues well. I think the slogan of we can do better is the kind of thing you say to a kindergarten who's just spilled the milk. You know, you can do better than that. When was the best time for all the things that you've just spoken about? You mean about women's in issues? Era, yeah, in yeah. era. Well, I think the late 70s and the 80s were very, very good, really good. And I really was pissed, if you can leave that in this tape, I was pissed when Gloria Steinem bowed out because she was really, in my opinion, the best spokesman we had. Why did she bow out? Whatever her personal life uh -huh. was, but I think she also bought what I considered a very foolish position on the part of the women's movement, that we didn't have leaders. We would not have leaders. Everybody would be a leader, which is nonsense in my never humble opinion. Um, leaders are important. Kate Michaelman was a wonderful leader, but where are the other Kate Michaelmans, you see? And where are the talented presidential candidates? And pre you know, there are periods in history when talent doesn't show up when you need it. You don't suppose it skips a generation or two, do you? Could. Yeah. Could. There could be all kinds of reasons yeah. for it, including genetic ones. It is not true that the times produce the leaders. I'm beginning to think that leaders produce the times. <laughs> June, can creativity be taught? I have a problem with the question because the word creativity itself is very messy. It's an inchoate word with lots of different definitions, none of which really work. I use cur the word curiosity. Um, I prefer making something to using the word creativity. It's so fraught with sentimentality for example, people are always saying that children are so creative and somehow it gets pounded out of them, you know, which is such a sentimental and goofy kind of thing to say. There are a lot of children that aren't creative, a lot of people that are, what do I mean by that? I mean being curious and noticing. I think the habit of noticing, of, of saying, what just happened? What was it made of? It's kind of like scientific uh, exploration. What's, what's going on here? What's she thinking? What's she thinking? What are you thinking? And what does that mean? And can we make something out of it? Um, we need, we, we have some very large semantic problems. And one of the things I'm pr proposing at Rutgers it is to hold an international conference on the semantics of printmaking. But actually, I think it's needed on the semantics of politics, especially on the semantics of religion, and on, certainly in aesthetics as well. We, we don't have uh, efficient words at the moment. When I'm struggling to say something on the word processor and I'm looking for a word, to, to me it's a semantic problem. I know it's a bigger issue than that. But how do you say what you mean and how do you identify what you mean? That is, I think, um, a kind of scientific problem. And a, a little more intellectual rigor would go a long way. 
uh, in that in the, in that respect. In our field, especially visual arts, uh, we we have a lot of talk, but we have a very limited vocabulary. My work has been a stream of related ideas. I have an idea, and each time I work, everything I do produces a little bud, as it were, that I can't use in that work, but that's worthy of exploration on its own. So that I see in my work a consistency of ideas that nonetheless in their expression do not look alike. But if you scratch it, the, you know, off, un, underneath there's a part of a larger kind of um, interest that I have. I plan to go back very soon. I have three or four projects underway going simultaneously, which I always have. And I'm planning a group of four paintings that will go back to the optical devices, but which will function, which will be four short stories, visual short stories, in effect, for which I'm doing the research. Um, and I I, I, have a, I want to do a project about the aurora borealis, for which I've been researching a long time. I have an idea that I've tried three or four times and it hasn't worked. I want to try again for a painting called Night Swim, um, which, uh, as, as I say, I'm doing the research for because I do a lot of preparation for, for a piece. I'm doing the research for, and you can see it here, I want to do a work that dramatizes the uh, crisis of the piercing of the wall between the secular state and democracy. Hmm. That I consider to be the key symptom or the key element in the world crisis that we're having at the moment. And over there is my map in which we are with pins locating just in this vicinity the number of churches, mosques, temples, etc. as physical presence. And as you see, the map already looks like it has smallpox. I am terribly interested in and want to find a way to comment in my work on the fact that we have moved from the conventions of communication as argument logic, as um, democracy, to the direct violence of agents of various gods which in a funny way carry the idea of individual entrepreneurship to the illogical conclusion where all these agents of God feel that in the name of God they have the right to pass judgment and execute everybody who doesn't agree with them. This, and we are lost in how to deal with this. That is, some of us are lost. The radical right is not lost because it is acting as an agent of God and it's undermining the freedoms that we have had all my life at any rate for argument, logic, for differing. I don't know how I'm going to express that in work, but the map is one of them. And it will be a very ineffective way because visual communication is poverty stricken compared to the power of a film, for example. But I believe we're going to have to develop a totally new methodology for dealing with the crises that are going the world over. And I, we have to find a way of doing it without becoming what the agents of God have become. 
And from that point of view, I have to say that they have outsold us. They've done a far better job of marketing the product because we have to pause for heaven and hell, for judgment, for confession, for maybe you'll get to God, but maybe you won't. You may have to suffer for, uh, for, for, for ever, for being a bad girl or a bad boy. Whereas our enemies go instantly from the bomb to seven virgins, right? Now, if you're going to buy a product that gives you instant gratification, how do you sell something that's as complicated as our versions of religion, whatever these are? The framing of the issues is so bad, and we're so stuck on the devices of the... I don't know that there will be new devices. We may lose on that basis, but I want people to recognize that we are talking across, thinking across, and have already adopted the idea that the only way to deal is with preemptive strike, which is pre preemptive strike is the modus operandi, operandi yeah. of those who, are, who captured the, the Russian school, for example. All of this interests me, and it interests me as implied contact, content in my work. In many of my works, many of my works, there are five or six different levels. Uh, an idea doesn't interest me unless I've got a number of things going in it. And in one way, that's what makes art different from science. Science has to go to the hard fact. Once it's got that, then it takes off again. Whereas we do not want a hard and fast answer in art. We leave room for the spectator, the viewer, to move around and get a number of vibrations. I'm suspecting that what's most interesting about science and art is the ways in which they differ not the ways in which they coincide. And I'm busy trying to, you know, between 1 and 2 a.m. in the morning, because of the other hours are for other things. I'm trying to think through that question. How do these differ from each other? Uh, to sort out what... I think that art has a lot to offer science. And certainly the scientists are using artistic and poetic language, ecstatic language even. I'm not so sure going the other way how that's working because the fact is, Lynn, that we have very poor language, we artists. We do not have really, uh, we haven't found a way to frame the issue of what is art, for example. What is art? Can you name a definition that will hold? At the Just most to primitive? paraphrase the Duchamp thing. Yes, it's whatever. Whatever but, man makes and, cho and chooses to call art. Yes, but that's a little too roomy. <laughs> if you're going to have a debate on this subject or you really want to understand it, because visual art, at any rate, and I think to some degree other arts, visual art is non-sensual as compared, let's say, with music. The act of seeing and what you see is highly cerebral, and it has to be translated in very complicated ways through the brain. What you see, for example, finds it very difficult to evoke the other senses. A picture does not make you smell something. A picture may not make you hear something. 
One of the things I always try to do in my work is to invoke other senses, to, to break some of the distance between me and the viewer, to be able to call on a range of experience that visual art per se generally leaves untouched. Now, that, that's all recent thinking, and I haven't had a chance to test it at, against really clever challenge. Do you find that your work has changed a lot? Does it go through periods, like decades, where it'll all of a sudden sort of evolve and change into something else? The, the change, what happens is that I started out with certain interests. And then those interests remain. And it has become like a rope where it was first a thread. And all of the things that I've done become strands in the new work. And I will call on it or not, depending on whether it's relevant to what I'm doing. I find that, that the way I think and the way I see things is um, very consistent in spite of the fact that the work may look very different. If what you're trying to do is link one kind of sensation with another, with a felt sensation, then it, it's static. And that education is a good thing. Knowing The more you know about something, the better your chance of seeing it more richly. I think people have to know something about what I'm interested in. Uh, I don't think it's too much to expect an educated viewer.